Okay, everybody, we might make a start. Uh, today we'll have two lectures. The first lecture will be by uh, Natalie Coyles uh, from Cox Architecture, who will be talking about um, medium to large firms. And then the second lecture will be by me, uh, and uh, I've changed the program again. So today I'll be talking about client types and, um, and, uh, client and, and architect architectural services. Uh, but uh, just with last week, let's um, uh, take advantage of, of Natalie's uh, uh, knowledge and experience and, and uh, uh, after her lecture you can uh, ask her things pertaining to the lecture but also to the uh, assignment, the group assignment that, that you're all doing. Um, and, and I'll uh, walk around with the, uh, with the microphone. So uh, Natalie, I'll hand over to you. Um, 40, 40, 45 minutes ish. Okay. Yeah, you may have no some worries. time for questions. Excellent. And then, uh, in, well, do you want to use this, or are you happy with? No, this is fine. Okay. I can I can stand still. So hi everyone. I'm Natalie Coyles, and I'm uh, an associate with Cox Architecture. Having been there, I think it's going on just over 10 years now. So um, it feels like I'm part of the furniture. Uh, okay. So Cox Architecture is um, look. These, these were some questions that John has given me previously to touch on and, and we'll go perhaps a bit more in depth about the process of how a large practice delivers architectural projects. Um, but to introduce Cox Architecture, we are a national practice. So we've got offices across the country. Um, we're in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth and Adelaide is, is, a, recent, is a recent one. Um, and also Canberra. So our Canberra studio has about 40 to 50 people. It, it ebbs and flows with how many staff we have. It really is a construct of how many desks we have um, in the office at any time. The practice itself um, fluctuates between four and 500 typically across the country. One of the aspects that makes um, Cox Architecture perhaps somewhat different to um, to some other practices is the the studios themselves are all co-owned. So we've got a board of it must be there's a there's a board of management which has five to six directors on it, but there's about 40 directors across the practice, and they all are shareholders in each of the branches. So it's not that one branch is owned and operated by a cluster of directors. They actually have a have an equilibrium of ownership between all the groups. So in the last Probably in the last five years, there's been almost a second, the second tier, so the coming of age of, of the first batch of directors with Philip Cox and John Richardson. Locally, we had um, Graham Humphreys and Rodney Moss. They've all started stepping back as they're in their 70s. Um, they've started stepping back, and, and a younger group of directors are now coming up. And the transition's been relatively successful, in my opinion, in that the the directors are largely stepping down, and, and it's an interesting process as to at that, at that end of the of the career. How do you step down gracefully? Um, how do you, you know, maintain involvement on your terms, having been an owner of an organisation and, and run it? How can you sort of pull yourself out? And I think it's it's a very personal journey, and it's certainly been one that's been incredibly open in the Canberra office. And we went through a process of transition over about 10 years, and and it's ever evolving. Um, Cox, as an organisation, is quite is quite open with all of its staff. It's quite uh, generous with its ownership arrangements, um, and and certainly believes that the organisation is the sum of its people. Uh, so. I thought just to give you, you know, a rough idea. This, this is um, we all moved desks last week, so th this is roughly how a how an architecture practice of 40 people or so works. We've got a space of about 320 metres squared with those 40 people. The moment we sit in cornrows, in a sort of weird shaped space, and that's our building down on the Kingston foreshore. So we've got a small balcony, which is where the doors on that side of the screen are going to. It's elevated, we're all up on level one, and we've got some meeting spaces and things on the ground below. Again, that's always a point of, uh, you know, who, who designs who sits where in an architectural office. Um, we typically leave it to the office managers because otherwise it becomes an all-in design war. Um, but the, the general approach is that we want everyone up 
at one level. We don't want to have staff across two levels. Our Sydney and Melbourne offices do split their teams either across an atrium space or by level. And the teams, they're, they're working with larger teams, um, but generally that, there'll be people within the office that they don't know. So I think once you hit that sort of 50 people mark, you're not going to know everybody and what they do. Sitting at 40, you can really know everybody, um, but much greater than that. Some, some will say the magic number is probably between 20 and 30. Um, to have a team of about that many, you can manage your projects quite effectively. Once you start getting a bit bigger, it gets a bit trickier. So who's in the office? We've got, we've got our directors and our associates. We've got a graphics team. At the moment, the team has two people. They work on all of our um, bids, so winning work. They also work on our architectural presentations, so they'll colour up sketches, they'll pull together images. We've got a, a 3D team who work in, I don't really know what they work in, they, they model things and make pictures of things and generally are quite magical about that. There's, you know, rhino and grasshopper and we use Revit a lot. Um, some of us can still use AutoCAD, but we also draw by hand. So, yeah. Uh, so one's an interior designer who has a real passion, so he spends his nights reading about the latest technologies in architectural rending, renderings. And the interiors do use a lot of internal renders for space because you know, it's more than just applying finishes. It's very much about how to, how to manipulate the space. Um, and the other is, a, is an architecture grad. Um, it's, it's, a really, it's a really challenging role to fill. So we're often looking for people who have a, a particular interest in that. We don't see that there's, it is a production role as opposed to a design based role. And I think that's where it's tricky because a lot of the grads come out and they think because they're great on the computer they can design in it. I don't believe that the principles of design are able to be effectively um, interrogated in a 3D modelling environment. I think it is a different process. So we, we typically try to extract the processes and almost have your special people who can do particular aspects and it all comes together. And that's really where the strength is, is that no one person can work on the scale of projects that we're working on. We need a collaborative team who everyone understands their roles and can, and can pull together to, to make it happen. Um, and of course, that's not to say that there's not challenges and people, you know, people are in places where they're stretching, where they're, you know, we're trying to get growth and if there's a particular interest, we can try and work towards that. Um, you know, it's nuts most days. Um, so we've got our graphics team, we've got a couple of office managers and that's really, again, over the years we've, we've argued about whether the practice needs receptionists. Like is that an overhead that the architects should be carrying? Do we need to work more to hire more people so that they can, you know, answer the phones and things? Shouldn't we all answer the phone? Um, in my opinion, we do need to have some people looking after our people. So just helping us with um, setting up rooms for meetings, making sure that people are, you know, tidying up after themselves, making sure that we've got paper for the photocopier. It's a really small thing, but it needs to be replaced uh, fairly, fairly constantly. And generally making sure that, you know, the windows are clean, that, you know, someone needs to talk to the cleaners, to the people that pick up the rubbish. Um, with, with 40 to 50 people, there's a lot of things going on around um, that, that interrupt the design process and the design work. So if we can get our teams to be able to be collaborating and delivering architectural work, that's the best for us. Now where are we going to get to? So the range of projects that we do, um, we're fairly versatile in what we do. The Canberra office does residential, so this is a residential project that was completed um, last year, so it was a heritage addition. We also look at urban projects, so this was a, a stair project that we worked with some civil engineers in the Woden Town Centre. Um, it, it, for, for a seemingly small project, that must have been in the office for about five years on and off um, and required quite a lot of coordination between the ACT government. It, it was subject to a lot of land acquisition. There were a number of land ownership issues associated with creating an urban plaza space and then we had to work with services engineers, civil engineers, landscape architects, uh, adjacent building owners 
um, and then a construction team to ultimately build a stair. So what seems like such an easy, an easy thing was actually quite, quite challenging. Uh, then we also do retail architecture. So we, one of our major clients is QIC in the Canberra Centre. That's their asset. Um, so we're constantly doing tenancy work for the different shops that are coming and going. Not the fit out work itself necessarily, but um, helping QIC with the leasing arrangements and tenancy plans. Uh, we did the new Dendi extension, which is sitting up on top of the car park. Um, this is Casey Marketplace down up in Gungahlin, which uh, we recently did with Worth Street, who was a new, a new sort of developer who delivered the estate. We do a lot of residential work, so multi-unit residential. I haven't got a photo of that. Um, but essentially, we do projects that are interesting. And I think that the, the goal for any architecture firm is to be able to choose your clients. Um, at the moment, at the moment we're, in a, we're in a privileged position where we are able to say to some people that we won't work with them because we don't like the way that they are. Um, we don't like the way that they treat our staff and, and we don't value their contribution to the public realm. And that's a really privileged place and it's certainly not something, it's something that we talk about quite frequently. And it's not that we'll never work with them again, it's just at the moment we don't value what they're doing and we would rather not work with them. Um, and I think ultimately as an architect that's really where you want to get to. You want to get to the place where you can pick and choose what the jobs are that you're interested in and, and how you can add value um, through architecture. To me that's what gives you fulfilment. So the next, the next few slides are talking about a, a particular project, sort of taking it from cradle to grave, you know, from, from con concept into realisation. And this is a project, now it's getting on, it's getting on a little bit, um, but it's actually the, the building that we occupy. So it was known as Site 18 down on the Kingston foreshore. And the process from the client initiating contact with us to design and develop um, a building for this site to the time that it was complete was probably two and a half years. So again, they're slow moving, um, but two and a half years is, is, is a comfortable time frame. Sometimes you might get it just under two years for a, this, we're talking about a six storey building. It's got about 80 units, um, ground floor retail space and a single level of basement. So we always start any project with understanding its context. I think as an architect that's really our role. We have to understand how it knits into the existing um, urban framework that we have. So understanding in Canberra, I mean the Central Basin area and East and West Basin are, are obviously sort of prime sites. They're lovely sites in Canberra that um, thankfully there's still lots of land there so lots of opportunity for you all to be involved. But the Kingston foreshore at the time had no buildings on the water. It had a site for you. This, this one was here, but at the time that we came in, all of the sites down the harbour, or well, the harbour's not even, it was these sites down through here, and then there was the, the island, which was a man-made island. So we came, we came along and had a look. Our site is there shown in grey. We always start with, with a, typically with a hand drawing. A hand drawing lets you understand what's there. You can look at it on photos, you can walk the site, but to actually really pick up the geometry and understand it, I think I certainly find great pleasure in, in drawing it by hand um, and thinking about what you can see, where the winds are coming from, where the sunshine goes and what the opportunities are for the site. It starts setting up where you can access the site um, and, and you just get a good feel for where you are in the world. So from there we typically work into yield studies. Um, so the developers really want to know pretty, pretty early on if they can get the cost of construction to stack up with the land value. Um, so the yield studies, again, these, these can be done fairly effectively on the computer and it's probably becoming more common for us to, to do them in CAD, but these were hand-drawn at the time. Um, and they're really just looking at interpreting what the controls say and so you might have various different controls. There'll be the planning code that you'll need to adhere to. Uh, there may be lease and development controls upon the site. 
there may be opportunities. A lot of um, jurisdictions are now looking at incentivising if you deliver more affordable housing, you might be able to exchange for additional height. Um, so there's a few mechanisms that, that governments put in place to encourage perhaps a better quality urban re realm or um, a particular incentive for a particular product that they're after at the time. So these are usually generated within a couple of weeks. So the client makes contact with us, they give us a brief, maybe within the first, you know, a day, a day really would get you to the first cut and you might workshop it with the team um, and then take it back to the client to, to, to give them the first pass as to where you're at and how it's going. Now, they will then typically give you an indication as to whether that's working for them or not working. Um, if it's going well, then you might start engaging very lightly with a structural engineer, with a civil engineer, just to talk about what's happening in the broader context. Um, and also you might start engaging with your planning agency. So this is the sort of drawing that, that we start, it starts softening it up and starts telling the story a bit more. So we've got the sunshine coming back, we're showing a bit more context in it, we're looking at um, where we can get you know, good, good commercial space at ground, where the building entrance points are, um, and just generally how, how the massing is going to work at the ground level. We might do some 3D sketches. Again, this, this would be over, it might be a CAD-based massing and we'll sketch over the top of it just to soften it and add a bit more character. Um, in, in my experience, working with hand drawings at the early stages doesn't frighten people off. If you go to the community with a CAD render for your first engagement with them, they're going to be incredibly hostile. They're going to think it's done and there's no point you even talking to them. They want to see that it's still fluid and still flexible. And again, these hand sketches can be done really quite quickly. You know, within an hour you can have a pretty compelling drawing and you can actually add the character to what the design intent that you're seeking, um, you're seeking to achieve. So then, if it's all going well, you'll start engaging in, in a mixed use project like this. We would have then started engaging with a um, market expert, so a real estate agent of sorts, to start talking about what the market wants. How many one bedroom units, how many two bedroom units, is there a market for three bedroom units, what are the appointments within them, is it two bedrooms, two bathrooms, is it three bedrooms, two bathrooms, do you want you know, one bedroom, one bathroom. Um, this process usually takes about a month, um, depending on how many different unit types you have. Generally, repetition is seen as a, as a really good thing um, from the market side, so from the developer side, they'll love repetition. From the living side, I like to think of each unit individually and I like to consider where I would like to sit in it. I probably, you know, really throw myself in to everything that I do and think about how I would occupy that space, where I want to get the sun, where I want to look at. Um, you know, how far do I have to carry my grocery bags when I'm coming home? Um, and that, again, that's, that, that is really the role of the architect, is to advocate for the future, the future occupier. So once we've got a scheme mapped out by hand, perhaps we've had a quantity surveyor run the figures over it, uh, we've touched base with the planning agency, they're pretty happy, we might have gone to the community and had a bit of a chat to them, they're usually wondering when you're going to be selling the units. Um, then we start getting serious about developing a development application documentation and the later that you can commit it into CAD, the better, I think, because if you've got a model that's been um, convoluted with a whole lot of hands developing a whole lot of options to get it to this point, it's really laborious to be able to get rid of all of the irrelevant information and have a clean scheme. So. My preference is to, start, is to start the CAD once everything's locked in. Once you've got, you know what the units are, you know how much commercial you've got, you know how high your buildings are going to be, um, and you know what the structural system is going to be. You can understand the way that they're going to construct the basement. So basements can be constructed in many different ways. You'll typically be working with your civil engineers and your structural engineers, and they will have come up with a, with a system and if you agree with them, then that's fantastic. Otherwise, you have to go through the process of um, talking to them about the expression that you would like from the structure. 
Um, and then you can start getting CAD bases together. Once you've got your CAD bases together for a scheme, then the consultant team goes wider. So then you'll engage with your electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, probably your landscape architects if there's landscape um, components associated with it. Uh, who have I forgotten? Hydraulic engineers, so they do the, the, water, the water works. And they all want more space than they need. So the, the trick with engineers is that they'll always give you spatial requirements early on. They're usually twice what they need. And so the, the rub is always that you're trying to, trying to fight them back so that you can give more space to the, to the people who are going to occupy the building. So sections are, are always important, particularly in establishing the way that the building relates to the ground. So you can see, you can see in these sections that there's different arrangements of the ground um, sometimes the podium comes up, but at other times the ground is running into the building. And that's quite purposeful in that you might step a podium up if you've got a residential use at ground floor so that a person walking on a footpath is their eyes at about 1500. You might be up a metre and then a half metre balustrade so that someone can sit, look over a balustrade and they're not looking sort of face to face or people aren't looking down into their, into their private open space. Um, so the sections are important with height controls. There's a pretty strict height control here, which is why you can see there's not a lot of articulation at the top of the building. Um, but ultimately, it's, by the time we've got into the position of, of creating CAD elevations and renders, we know what the building's doing. We've explored it um, with, with the team, and we're really developing um, drawings for approval. So the process now will have taken us probably three to four months Along, along the line. So once it goes into the planning system, it then sits with them uh, for anywhere probably between three to six months. And at that time, it might be that the project stops and halts and you just wait until there's some assurance given by the planning agency. It depends on how much finance the developers require for the project. So they might go into a pre-sales. It's not uncommon for developers to have to sell 30 to 50 percent of the of the product before they're al allowed financially um, to start construction. So that becomes a bit of a waiting game. And I think in an architectural practice that's really the the crux of, of managing incomings and outgoings. So you've always got your team, you've got to keep them rolling. You can't just give them a job and have them sitting there while it waits for planning approval. They need to be moving into something else. Planning approvals, you never know how long they're going to take. It depends how contentious it is. It depends what the political state is. There's often ministers involved if it's contentious. And the scale of jobs that we're working on, there's often, they're often in the paper. Um, so there's usually some contention around them. And we just have to, I guess, juggle the projects through the team to be able to manage our workflows. So then you get into the, into the architectural renderings. Um, these start happening generally for the marketing. This becomes the real estate campaign. Um, so the, the, planning, uh, the, the planners are calling for them a little bit more um, these days. I'm always a little bit resistant because I think planners, the people who approve and planning agencies, should be able to read traditional architectural drawing methods. They should be able to read a plan and a section and an elevation. Um, I'm reluctant. I think that these 3D renders often, there's a myriad of, of inconsistencies in them. There's a lot of manipulation to get them to look right, um, which doesn't necessarily translate to what's been approved to be built. So there's a bit of a, bit of a rub there. So once all of the planning approvals have come through, then we get into really technical drawings. So that then becomes construction documentation. The construction documentation depends on the um, method of construction and the contract that the developer has with the builder. So a number of developers have in-house builders, um, so that will typically be a client managed contract. Construction managed contracts are quite common where the construction company has inputs from the client and we are just seen as a consultant, similar to your mechanical, electrical, uh, to anyone else. Other contracts may see the client engaging the builder and the architect sits at, a, at an equal level 
So the client's sitting here and they have their builder and their architect, usually at loggerheads. Um, but ultimately we can have communication to the client to advise when the builder's making a value management choice which compromises the intent of the building. Um, that's always our preferred method. We typically, in terms of the way that our consultant teams are pulled together, uh, we typically prefer the client to engage the subconsultants independently. So we have a client who will engage architect, mechanical engineer, landscape architect, civil engineer. We don't really want to handle their invoices and their paperwork. We don't. I, you do have to do it for your registration process, but. Um, I don't really like the paperwork too much. I prefer to be doing the buildings. Um, so it just becomes too, too laborious when you've got 100 projects on the, on the books. To be managing your subconsultants' invoices almost becomes you'd need three people to do it. Um, so at this scale of project, we do prefer that to be managed either by a project manager. So that's, that's another method. If your client doesn't have a builder and they're not sort of fulfilling that that project management role. There are companies that specialise in project management, so they then become um, the conduit between architect, client and builder, and everything feeds into them. They can be fairly ruthless though as well. So I encourage you always to keep a good rapport with the client because they pull the strings at the end of the day. And if you're able to phone them and have, if you're able to establish a relationship of trust with them and pick up the phone and, and have a conversation with them if you're genuinely concerned about the outcome that a decision's going to negatively influence, then I, that's, that's the best place to be. If your client's lost faith and doesn't listen to you, then your building's probably going to turn out pretty rubbish. Um, so maintaining that, that process of trust is really important. Uh, so, sorry, this, this, is a, this is a concrete set out plan. I should. Um, Elaborate. So this is really, it's almost like a shop drawing for the concrete pourers. And these are incredibly important for the ground plane to make sure that you've got all of your waterproofing and all of your transitions, thresholds um, between different, different wall finishes and perhaps different floor finishes. The way that the building really seams into the ground, if it's a public building into a public space at the, at the ground level, is really important. And your civil engineer is your best friend to help you with this if you've got a bit of slope and some water flow over the site. Um, I, I quite like concrete set out plans for the ground floor. I find them always very interesting to look at. So that, we then typically cut a number of key sections. So we're not gonna cut you know 20 sections around the building, but generally there'll be maybe three or four key sections where there's building materials that we're interested in interrogating Again, the way that the relationships are working. So this is, this is sideways. Um, so we've got the roof up here. There's a larger setback and a terrace environment with a, with a solid balustrade, where we've got some units down here with glass balustrades coming down into the ground floor arrangement. So there's a lot of waterproofing issues that we've got with external spaces over internal spaces. It happens a couple of times in this building. It's not something that you really want to have happen. We've got large overhangs, so looking at what the parapet's doing as opposed to what the window heads are doing. Um, and then you'll see in here that there's a number of, of detailed sections which, which these plans then refer to. So then we start looking at almost tracing the building around and looking at all of the different seams and all of the different intersections. Uh, looking at different awning types. Um, again, always thinking about how the structure, how's it being held up, what's the expression, how's it interacting with the building form generally. And then these are, these are photos of the, of the building at the end. Um, so the documentation process, depending on whether the, the, the building team is going out to tender, so they might tender sub trades, so you'll be doing trade package documentation where they'd be calling for, perhaps it's, you, your early trades are usually concrete, um, for, and structure. Then they might do windows, um, drywalls and partitions, and then they start getting into joinery, um, fixtures and fittings, and those sorts of things. So if you, if you are under a, under a tender which is by trade, 
your builder will usually give you trade packages breakdown and you'll document to suit their procurement process. An alternative is a lump sum uh, trade where you'll be given three or four months to document the building entirely and you'll come up with a document set which is you know, anywhere between sort of 50 to 100 pages um, and that then goes to the market in one hit. So all the trades will then be tendering at the same time and targeting a lump sum price. There's a lot more risk in a lump sum contract typically because anything that is added or taken away is a variation on that contract. With um, trade packages, it's by trade. So there's a bit more room to be um, making some manipulation along the way, but also letting the trades potentially come up with innovation to support a more efficient or a better way to construct the building. So you haven't documented everything and resolved everything. You've really left it at perhaps 80% documentation. It's gone out to the trade. Trade comes back in. They might have some comments on it. You'll make adjustment to resolve all of the different trades coming back together for that 20%, which is then you, um, for construction documentation. So I think in a nutshell that's, that's about it. Um, in terms of how we would take a single project and work through. Um, so I guess I'll open up to questions if that's... if I covered everything that you'd hoped? Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll, I'll start uh, the questions um, uh, with the... Uh, retiring directors, uh, yes. what uh, you, you were talking about them sort of backing out slowly. So could you talk a bit more about a bit more about what they're doing? Yes, about yeah. their role after they uh, after they've backed out, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So I don't I don't know that that we'll ever see them retire. I, I I don't know whether that's a bit of an outdated. I don't think that they want to retire. Um, essentially, they. They stood down from being a director and a new term was established called fellow. So we've got a whole lot of fellows now. Um, and the fellows really just make up their own rules. So we see them at their will. They come and they go. They've still got desks in the office. Um, and, and we'd like to keep, keep it that way. They still add a lot of value to what we do. So I, I still have conversations with the with Graham and Rodney weekly, really. Um, they still engage with, with particular clients that they've got long established relationships with. Um, there's usually another director involved now, but uh, Graham, Graham structures himself. I think he's, he officially works one day a week, but he'll often be in the office three or four days a week for a period, and then he might be gone for two or three months. Um, it depends what projects he has on. So he's recently completed um, the Samoa High Commission building. So that was quite, he was quite passionate for that. He's working on a house at the moment with some people. I'm not sure how we know them. Um, he's still involved in education projects. So he's always on the phone as you need. He's always on the email as you need. And he's typically around in the office sometimes. It's a little bit unpredictable, but, but still there to call upon. Rodney. Um, Rodney's perhaps been a bit more um, diligent about his sort of withdrawal process. So he, he stepped down and then tried to work three days a week, um, which he was pretty successful at. So he would still come in those three days a week um, and, and have his meetings and do his drawings and um, pull everything together. These days, and so that, when I say he was doing that, it's probably five years ago that he stepped down as a director. Um, these days we see him both, both the fellows come in for design reviews every week. So we have reviews of projects every Wednesday afternoon. They're always at the table for that. That's the formal process for us to seek their guidance. Um, but then they both, you know, again, Rodney's just done a YAS, a house out in YAS. Um, he's still involved in some education projects up in Sydney. Um, and, you know, just a font of knowledge, really. So. They're always very welcome to come in and, and talk. Philip, on the other hand, so Philip in the Sydney office, again, I think he's still there two or three days a week. Um, it's really, 
I think that they've got such a high regard within the practice that they can do what they want. They can't really do anything wrong. Although they do, no, that's, that's a lie. They do upset the feathers sometimes. There's a bit of, um, Rodney particularly, he likes to, to be a bit of a, um, he stirs the pot. <laughs> Very good. Um, I might throw it up for questions. Uh, any, any questions? Uh, if you can't think of any questions about the lecture, think about your own uh, uh, group assignment and, and how uh, Natalie might be able to help you with things that have come up in the last week while she's here. One of the issues we're um, grappling with is a point of difference and niche in the market. Um, can you kind of just talk about maybe how Cox has carved their own niche and Yep. the best way forward to try and differentiate and create a body of work that flows. Yeah, that's a, um, it's always a real challenge to be able to define who you are and how you're different. So, and it's something that we often talk about. To look at the body of work by Cox Architecture, it's really hard to see a common thread. So even in the photos of projects I've shown you, you, know, you wouldn't know that they're all by one practice. Um, I think Cox prides itself on being responsive to the context and being responsive to the project parameters as well. So it's actually, we're a commercial practice, so we appreciate that ultimately if the, if the building doesn't stack up, it's not going to get built. And it's really hard to get buildings to stack up, like it's really hard to get the numbers to work, to be able to get enough yield, to be able to get a, an appropriate architectural outcome. Um, that's, that's where the crux of, of our skill is. Um, so our point of difference, we, we advocate on behalf of design excellence. That's ultimately, you know, in the back of my head every day, it's like, is this a good design? You know, am I going to get crucified in a design review about it? Um, we want to deliver architecture. We don't want to deliver designed buildings. Um, we want to deliver places that people want to be. Um, we usually like to have a, have a community aspect to it, so not, you know, something that actually is of public benefit. What can we give for the, for the public? What are we giving back? Um, so on, on this project in particular, my little, my little gem was the courtyard. So it's a north-facing courtyard protected from the, wind, the winds off the lake. Now the buildings could have actually occupied that space. There's, there was a slither that needed to be left, but it could have had a much heavier footprint. So we were able to get everything to work around so that we could actually deliver this little pocket park in there which you know is there now forever which is a lovely thing. So our point of difference is we will typically challenge the rules for the right reasons. We're not going to just do as we're told and that works for and against us to, to be honest. Um, there's, there's certainly those, um, those that win work because we don't, we won't be a builder's architect. We won't do as we're told. <laughs> hey, now. Hey. <laughs> um, two questions. One is sort of about team management, so the different scales of work that you have on and how you sort of pull and push and adjust the team sizes. And then the other one is, how do you sort of procure those jo the jobs that you want to pursue? Yeah, in as the first place. As opposed to just sort of waiting for clients to... Come knocking. Yeah. They don't come knocking. <laughs> I wish they would. Um, so in terms of team, the team sizes and, and the way that we manage that, so we have meetings every week. Um, the management team meets for probably two hours every, at the moment it's on Friday mornings. We sit in a room, we talk about, I guess it, it works for procurement as well actually. So we sit in a room and we talk about opportunities. So Tenderlink um, is a, a, I don't know what you call it, it's where anyone who's putting out a public tender, they all go to this thing called, this portal called ten, Tenderlink. And the other one is ACT Procurement. Um, they send auto emails, so there's constantly a stream of emails from the Tenderlink people about new tenders coming out or um, addendas to, to tenders that are out. 
So those are coming through constantly. We touch base on Fridays about what opportunities we're keen to pursue. We usually will marry it with, is there an interest in the management team for someone to champion it? So it needs someone who wants to take that on. Um, is there capacity in the group for us to take it on at the time? Um, and then is it worth us taking it on? So that's a bit of a comp competitor analysis. If someone else has already done the work and it's just a documentation job, then we're not particularly interested. If there is a design opportunity in there, then, then we might pursue it a bit more interestingly. So, so that's, I'm just running through our Friday meetings. That's usually our first port of call on a Friday morning is new work, winning work. Um, what flows on from that is generally a conversation about other um, conversations that have gone on around town in the week. So it might be that there's a parcel of land that's going up for sale. Perhaps we've done some work for the City Renewal Authority in proofing up the capacity of that site so we'd expect developers to be in touch for yields. Um, or perhaps there's just been someone's come up with an idea that they want to look at something on a particular site. So that might be another um, quick design exercise that we, that we choose to take on in that week. That's really about winning winning work. Once we understand loosely what we've got, what the new jobs are in the office, then we think about the jobs that we're already servicing and how those teams are going. So if there's a client which is screaming because the work's not getting done because we've under-resourced a project, that usually becomes apparent pretty quickly. Um, and so then we'll look at perhaps there's another job where there's a, um, a project pressure that can be, um, you know, held, we can hold a job for an extra week or something and we can divert people into where the spot fire is and then we can pull them back, all while, tr all while trying to give continuity to project teams. Um, it is definitely a black art in, in trying to allocate resources um, each week and it's usually a bit of a, um, there's a bit of trading and and conversation going on. But, but generally as a management team, the whole you know, there's, there's 10 of us, I think, in the room at the moment, so 10 out of 40 or 50, there's a, f a fair conversation about what's going on and, and how it's going to work. And if we are feeling that things are getting a bit slow, so w we also do forecasting, so we'll forecast what our projected um, billings will be for the next three to six months. That's usually pretty constant. Um, so that will give us a read about whether we've got enough work to sustain the team or whether we need to, we've been really lucky lately and we've been needing to have more people, more so than we've been needing to think about reaching out to get more work. Um, there's some, in terms of getting jobs that we actually want though, <laughs> so there's always lots of, there's lots of jobs on, to get the ones that we really want, we might, um, we might look at competing. So we might put a competitive fee in for a piece of work where we want to, um, perhaps take an opportunity and we want it really very much. So that comes down to pitching the price at the right point for how much we'll deliver the work for. Um, we're not, we're, we're usually considered an expensive practice in the market. Um, but that said, it, it, I don't know how you, how you, how you judge it. We don't often put variations out either. So we'll, we'll give a price and we'll usually honour the price. Um, I think there's a lot, well, I think, I don't know, but there's, there's others who perhaps will give a price for a base service and then add on. So they'll add other, other components, but we like to be fairly upfront, know what we're going to give at the beginning and, and I, I don't love having fee conversations, so I'd rather just be upfront and honest about them, generally. <laughs> so everyone knows everyone's in it for money, that's why we're working. Um, Although we do love what we do as well. Natalie, could you <coughs> uh, speak a bit more about uh, the work you, you do for developers, like when there's land releases mm -hmm. and uh, developers come and, and, uh, and ask you uh, uh, to do some yield studies. Is, it's, do you do that on spec with them? That, is this before they bought the land or? Yeah, well it depends a little bit. So on some occasions and for some clients, we may do spec work. Um, spec work's going to send you backwards though pretty quick. Like there's only, it, it really does need to be a two hour sketch to be on spec and, and these, 
will usually caveat with if they're successful in procuring the land that they're committed to having us engaged for services. Um, a way around that is, is that we might do a five to $10,000 scheme. So that'll give us a couple of days to be able to look at the planning controls and interrogate it a little bit more. Sometimes they will have had a planner already do that. So we'll get um, a summary by a planner provided and then we can respond to that with opportunities and constraints. Um, again, this is where the hand sketch really comes in because to, to be doing any of this in CAD, um, it just, it sort of, you know, you've, you've burned your fee before you've even done anything. Um, so that's probably one of the most common. There's often design competitions or design charrettes. So it might be that an existing client's testing market. So we'll be in a competition with two or three other architectural companies. Um, there'll be a nominal, could be ten to $20,000 fee associated with that. Um, we'll put a team on it, develop some ideas, um, and then put that back hopefully to win, to win the job. Um, what is perhaps more commonly the case is that we've already done design studies on a lot of the sites around town. So um, we've been engaged by government, or we're, we're constantly engaged by government to be testing sites, to be working with engineers about whether they can build roads and things in subdivisions. Um, so the Land Development Agency, which is now the City Renewal Authority or the Suburban, I don't know what the Suburban one's called, but that's the same, the same sort of thing. Um, they, for the last, again, probably five years have been subdividing parcels of land and then selling off individual blocks. So for them to subdivide the land, they really need to know what dimensions the blocks need to be. So we do a lot of the preliminary studies and yield assessments to make sure that you can get enough parking, the amount of GFA, so gross floor area, be it commercial, residential or retail, that they can get on the site. And also taking into account shadowing and where public space should be and all those sorts of things. So that's often information that we have in house before the land is on the market. Um, so they might come to us and, and that's when we would typically ask them to give us a brief as to what they want and then we'll manipulate our base information to suit their, their purpose. And that's where we might do them more on spec because we've already, we've already done the work. I'll throw another one out. Um, <coughs> uh, in the beginning, uh, what kind of uh, networks did uh, Graham and Rodney uh, use in order to, to get work? I mean, you know, apart from these formal networks, were there um, sort of uh, non, how can I say, more sort of uh, non-business or non-government type networks that were used? Yeah, so we actually just had, um, we had John Richardson, who was one of the founding partners with Philip Cox up in Sydney, gave us a lecture um, just last week in the office, which was really interesting. So Cox Architecture existed in Canberra before Graham and Rodney came along. Um, so the practice was here based on a competition that had been done for, could have was it the High Court? Did you listen to it, Trent? Did you hear it? No, okay. Um, I think it was the High Court or something. It was under the NCDC and they lost the competition. They didn't win it, but, but it, the sketch had gone to the NC, oh, to the NC, what is now the NCA, but it was the, the NCDC at the time. And following on from that, they invited two to three architectural practices down for other work that, that they had. So we did um, Bruce Stadium in the mid 70s down here. So that was one following on from a failed competition response that, that NCDC, they couldn't develop fast enough, like they couldn't get enough architects in, in, in house. Now curiously, Rodney worked for the NCDC probably at that time. Um, I'm not sure where Graham was at that time, but, but the, the NCDC was an incredible network for, for that generation. And most architects of that age have all worked and had association. Engineers, architects and, and landscape architects are all associated with the NCDC. Um, I would say then they went on to have families and just general, general networks within Canberra. It's perhaps as Canberra grows uh, more appropriate to to have networks that of 
of interest, I suppose. We've got, we've got a guy in the office who's a really avid uh, mountain bike rider. So he's got a network of you know, people who go out in the bush um, mountain biking. And that's led to some really interesting work down in Victoria in um, transforming old rail tracks into cycle tracks and looking at bringing together um, facilities and trail information to support a tourism network. And it's all done by he puts a GPS thing on his bike and he rides and then that maps it for him and then he's got the skill to then be able to work with the facility um, manager to, to look at getting it in place so that a government can support a, a trail in a place. Um, so I think it's about you know keeping, keeping yourself with a life, keeping an interest and then pursuing architectural opportunities. It might be that if, you, if you've got kids at school you might sit on a school board um, and that teaches you a bit about education then you might go into to work with educational institutions in delivering architectural services or um, you know, it could be dog parks or could be any, any number of things. Rowing, rowing clubs, yes, and they, they've done rowing clubs. Um, yeah. any, any other questions? No other questions? Let's thank uh, Natalie for an excellent talk. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, let's um, let's just take a, a, a couple of uh, minutes break, um, and then uh, and then we'll get on with no. the uh, with the second lecture. Now you've got your. I've got everything. Excellent. Thank you. I hope that covered yes. what you needed. No, it's really good. Yeah. <laughs>
Plus technology. All right, everyone, shall we get going? <laughs> Where is Joel? Did he go back to work? All oh, right, okay. All right, let's, let's give him a few minutes. I'll be pretty quick anyway. Turn the lights back on. I'll go and have another sip of water.
Okay, Joel said it's five minutes. <laughs> we'll move on. Um, let me just get some light. Actually, I have enough light here. All right, um, today's uh, second lecture, lecture eight, is uh, going to be about um, the types of clients that, that architects usually have, uh, how architects might win commissions, and uh, architectural services. So this is really sort of... Uh, uh, taking on, the moving on in, in, in many ways from where um, Natalie left off uh, just then. So, <clears throat> I think both of these uh, things, architectural services and types of clients, uh, are relevant to the group assignment because it, it, it's about uh, what you're actually going to be providing and who you're actually going to be trying to work for. So, if we start with um, architectural services, traditionally speaking, there's uh, six um, core architectural services that you can see up here. And really, this will take you uh, through the process uh, from inception, um, uh, when you first uh, get appointed by the client, through to uh, 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 completion. All right, so concept design is, is actually starting on the design, and contract admin is actually um, administering the, the building contract uh, to, to completion and then handing over to, to the client. Now, uh, uh, this is, of course, based on the traditional procurement method, and we will be talking about procurement uh, in more detail at, in the second half of the semester. But the pr traditional procurement method uh, is really uh, what you might call a, um, a kind of lump sum method. Is that, what, is that what Robin calls it? I can't remember. Anyway, it's, it's, it is a, a procurement method where um, the uh, client comes to, to the architect, appoints the architect to do architectural works. Uh, from the architect's works, uh, um, a builder will then be um, chosen uh, to, to build the works, and then the architect will then uh, administer the building contract for um, the client uh, to get the building built. Now, um, uh, there's many other kinds of, of um, forms of procurement, and what we're procuring here is uh, is uh, is buildings. Okay, so it's the architect's role within uh, how a building gets built. Um, but we'll we'll talk more about that uh, later. I, I will just say that. Uh, Alternative procurement methods might see uh, architects do, uh, um, will see architects do less of, than all of these six stages. Uh, they'll be doing bits and pieces of it. Uh, rarely will they be doing uh, uh, number six, uh, and, and most certainly they'll be doing uh, uh, number one, two, three, and four. So at this point, maybe I'll go to uh, a piece of supporting information, which is. Um, this uh, document here. Now, what this document here is the, the middle pages uh, from uh, the uh, architect um, from from the uh, architect uh, client uh, agreement. So, uh, which which I have which I will uh, uh, which I have loaded up on the Moodle. So, what you can see there is that this is where I've gotten my headings from in terms of core architectural services and, and so on and so forth. So if I just quickly go through what that means, uh, it lays out here what all those things mean. So what concept design means, which includes things like uh, being briefed, uh, recording uh, those briefings, uh, getting uh, recommendations of, of appointments for specialist, specialist consultants as required for the client. So do we need an engineer, structural engineer, mechanical engineer, land surveyor, so on and so forth. Um, finding out about the site and so on. Uh, the, uh, the design stage within the concept design is really to, to uh, make that brief into a, a sketch design. Um, and, and to, as, uh, to prepare drawings so that uh, this can be discussed with the, with, with, the, uh, with the client. Now you see down here that uh, there's also sort of approvals as well in that we need to finish it at some point and get the approval of the client before moving on to stage two, which is de uh, de design development. So where the uh, sketch design is, is really getting a, a broad idea about uh, the uh, shape of the thing, how the spaces relate to each other, a general idea about materials. 
Um, design development is really to, to start to formalize those uh, quite sketchy ideas into something that, that uh, is more exploratory, will actually um, uh, allow the uh, architects and the client to work with the uh, consultants in order to, to bring out all the issues with the design, the structural issues, the mechanical issues, and so on and so forth. And, um, and generally, uh, at the end of that stage, you will have a, a much uh, better uh, described project with, with proper uh, overall dimensions and heights and an idea about materials and so on and so forth, although we may not necessarily know the, the fine detail of how the materials go together or what specific model of those materials they are. It is usually at this point, once we know that the building can be built to a certain overall set of dimensions, interior and exterior, uh, that we are able to go for uh, development application. Uh, and that's because we've got to know the thing is able to be built uh, before um, we put in for, for uh, a DA, uh, purely because of the difficulty to do with uh, modifying DAs, right? And once uh, we get our development uh, approvals, we would then uh, go through to uh, do construction documentation, which is really taking the design development and, and uh, turning that into a, uh, a legal document where everything is, is uh, described in a very complete and careful and considered way and coordinated way so that a builder will be able to um, will be able to uh, accurately price the job and, and know and figure out how to build it and during <coughs> and part of this will also be uh, that uh, <coughs> we will work with the building surveyor to make sure that uh, he or she is going to be happy with with uh, what we're proposing and, and that the building uh, approval will be uh, given uh, when the uh, contractor is or the builder is selected. Uh, sometimes uh, clients may already have um, uh, contractors or builders that they want to work with, in which case it makes it much easier, but quite often uh, they will want to uh, get a, a couple of uh, prices, if you like, uh, through a, a tender process or a less formal process. Now we're going to talk about tendering in the second half of the semester, so I won't go into it too much, but it is the architect who um, has more knowledge generally than the client in terms of contractors, in terms of, of what to look for, in terms of how to assess their um, references and their previous work and so on and so forth. Um, the uh, final uh, part of the uh, standard of the core architectural service would be your contract admin, and this is, this is during uh, the time or the period of the building contract when the building contract has been signed between the builder and the, and the client. The architect will step in on the client's behalf to administer that particular contract during construction. Uh, so that involves really to uh, make sure that um, everything is, is, is uh, being built according to the contract. Uh, the important uh, distinction here is that the architect is, is uh, being the superintendent um, of the contract and, and not being the builder. Therefore, the architect is not supervising the works. That's the job of the build, builder. The, the architect is just holding the builder to the contract. Okay. Um, now, on the same note, the architect will also um, assess all the claims that the uh, builder will be putting in for payment, and the architect will, will basically make sure that the builder has done the work that um, he, she says that they've they have done. Sure. Yes. Uh, the question is, uh, do you need experience in, 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 uh, in contract admin for registration? And the answer is uh, yes. So uh, generally, um, in the uh, registration uh, process, the architectural practice exam calls uh, for um, candidates to have a broad range of um, of experiences, but the actual uh, written exam itself and the interview uh, is going to be based on, on the standard architectural contract, the, the simple, what's it called, the uh, simple works contract, which is a contract that's been devised uh, between the AIA and the MBA, so the Institute of Architects and the Master Builders Association, which is the uh, standard contract used for uh, 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 simple works, which means, you know, probably sort of uh, a million up. Uh, smaller, smaller jobs can use simpler contracts. 
Okay, <coughs> so um, moving right along, uh, what is not included in uh, in uh, the core architectural services is uh, the additional architectural services, which are which are these uh, six things here. Uh, so these things, essentially, because they're additional architectural services, they will uh, um, attract uh, additional fees. So, so you remember Natalie talking about her uh, checking yields for or being appointed by developers to, to, to run the numbers on certain sites for certain types of buildings. Uh, that would also be called uh, feasibility studies to make sure, to, to see whether uh, the, the ideas of, of, the, of the developers stack up against how much they have to pay for a piece of land. Um, it would be also about um, uh, the uh, uh, recording of existing conditions. Um, and uh, while uh, additional, while, while core architectural services include uh, the submission or the preparation and submission for, of documents for development applications, uh, quite often they get uh, knocked back by authorities, especially uh, where there's uh, councils involved, um, and uh, and that uh, and and not always uh, on, on uh, any solid basis. Quite quite often now it's it's on political basis that things are knocked back. And that's because uh, the, the planning um, infrastructure is, is now run by the councils, not by the state government. So in effect, what happens is that the mayor of any one council, not that we have mayors in, in the ACT, but in New South Wales and Victoria especially, the mayors of, of individual councils then become the head town planner. And uh, what tends to happen is when you have non-expert people um, getting involved in the preparation of, of, uh, of statutory documents such as planning schemes is that uh, they're left with gaps as they try to fulfill their political um, promises um, uh, which got them into office in the first place. So what often happens is, is that um, uh, the uh, uh, clients decides that they want to appeal against the decision of, of the uh, authority. Um, and it needs to go to uh, an appeals tribunal such as the such as VCAT, the uh, Victorian uh, uh, Administrative uh, Appeals Tribunal, or, or its equivalent in the ACT, ACAT. Um, and and what happens there is that these things can be quite drawn out, and and uh, uh, architects need to to prepare may need to prepare uh, additional documentation, and may need to appear for days on end, sitting there waiting to be called. All of this stuff is not considered uh, a core architectural service, and, and so um, this stuff will also have to be uh, paid for separately by the client. And of course, that's why we have good uh, client architect agreements which lays these kinds of things out. Um, all of these things are also in, the, uh, in, in that same document I just showed you before. Number four, special illustration. So we need to make clear to, to our clients that we will give them uh, a certain suite of, of uh, illustrations, plans, elevation sections, uh, some simple 3Ds, uh, maybe some, some uh, 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 simple models and, and what have you. Uh, we need to give clients enough um, stuff so that they can understand, understand what we're trying to do uh, and that should be considered as part of the core. But, but any um, special illustration, so uh, anything that is not considered um, standard uh, needs to be charged separately. So all those um, marketing, all those renderings for marketing purpose and what have you, those would all be considered special illustrations. Uh, Fly-throughs, uh, VRs and so on and so forth. At the moment all of those things are considered special. They're not part of the standard um, uh, core services. Now this is not to say that uh, clients might not uh, ask for those things um, uh, through the course of a, of a normal project, but it's just that it's not usually costed into to architects' fees. You remember um, Natalie talking about uh, doing documentation for trade packages. These uh, uh, take a lot more time because essentially there's a lot more drawings uh, um, to, to prepare those things. So those things would also um, attract additional fees. So you need to charge more if you're doing that kind of thing. And then, of course, other services, which uh, perhaps I'll get to, uh, uh, I'll, which I'll get to later in in, uh, in this lecture. So <clears throat> that was really the the first part of the lecture, which is uh, what architects do for clients. 
So the next uh, thing we'll talk about is, is uh, the types of clients that architects usually get and, and how architects then get work from them. Natalie talked a little bit about this, but uh, I thought I might quantify it uh, uh, or classify it a little bit more um, carefully. So uh, architects uh, generally um, have uh, four different types of clients uh, traditionally, being individual, institutional, corporate or commercial, and government. So, uh, of course, there are many other people that are involved in the architectural projects, as I've spoken before, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, in, in later lectures. So, I guess the traditional uh, type of uh, client uh, for architects is the individual client. So, this is uh, generally uh, someone who wants to, to get uh, something built for themselves. Uh, mostly housing, but uh, but it can also happen that uh, um, individuals, uh, you know, uh, ha own businesses and, and, and other types of things and need facilities, and they would also be individual clients. <coughs> so um, what happens with many established architects is you can see that uh, they actually get work based on, on their reputation, on, on the ability to deliver architecture, on, on the awards they win, on, on how happy their older clients are. Uh, but in many cases, it's the chicken and the egg. So how do we actually get to, to that stage um, where we can uh, actually uh, be that famous, if you like, in order to have people just come to us? Um, because people, clients will not just come to you. We won't actually have the opportunity to choose who, which clients we want uh, straight away. So it's something that needs to be built. So um, basically, uh, it's got to do with with making uh, your firms known. All right, it's, it's about marketing. So I think I've said this all before, but it's worthwhile saying it again. Uh, how does one market to to? Uh, how does one make uh, one's uh, market know about uh, one's services. There's, uh, there's the basic ones would be um, uh, word of mouth uh, because you know your the clients you have in, um, recommend you to other people. Uh, personal networks such as friends, relatives, uh, work colleagues, associations, sporting clubs, and the like. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, the the other one would be would be to actually research what the market is, right? To actually uh, engage in in uh, finding out uh, whether there's actually a need for for architects of of your kind uh, in particular markets. So that's what I was I've been I've spoken up before about uh, uh, ringing up uh, architects in the area where you want to practice and and uh, seeing uh, and you know just seeing if if they have any capacity. So. If you're in a market where every architect you, re you ring up says that they can take on a job, uh, then obviously that market is not going to be one where you're going to get much traction because you have a lot of competition. On the other hand, if, if all the architects you ring up um, for your beach house uh, uh, say that they can't do it because they've got too much on, then you know that there's a, there's a market for that kind of architect. Uh, whatever the housing type is or, or whatever the building type is that you choose to get involved in. And for you guys, uh, going in terms of your um, assignments, I've suggested that, that you, you uh, um, say that you, you're calling up for, for, uh, for a relative who's, who's interested in, in, in getting an architect, but it could be as, uh, it could be as, as, uh, as simple as ring up and saying, you know, I'm going to be finishing architecture at the end of the year, is there any work out there? Yeah, and and if they if they say no, we've got too many architects, blah blah blah, then you know again that's that uh, that possibly this is not the correct market to be moving into. Um, the second type of uh, traditional uh, client is 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 the institutional client. So, um, how do architects get institutional work? Uh, quite often, institutions will, will have competitions uh, to, to build their buildings uh, where they give a, a nominal uh, fee for, for design. So what we see here is the National Museum of Australia by Ashton Reckett McDougall, um, for which there was a, a competition, a, a, a national competition. 
but uh, in terms of the Australian Institute of Architects, um, this competition was uh, not sanctioned by them and therefore an illegal uh, competition and that had to do with the prize money. So the Institute uh, uh, considers that every scale of competition should, be commensurate, should have commensurate prize money and if that prize money is not up to what the Institute thinks it is, then they will not sanction it. Um, ironically, of course, uh, Canberra, the nation's capital, uh, was um, was an architectural competition won by Griffin, which was also not sanctioned by the sanctioned by the Institute of Architects. The other ways of of uh, getting institutional work, uh, obviously, would be to to uh, befriend the people who who make the decisions and and in and get a personal introduction into that world. Um, but uh, the more likely way really is to uh, uh, apply to that particular institution to, to be on their panel of, of architects to do certain types of work. Uh, and this has a certain registration process uh, where you have to tell them what your capacities are, what kind of work you can do, how big the work you're uh, willing to do, how many people in your office and so on and so forth. So an example of this would be, uh, would be like um, universities. And uh, Melbourne University is, is, is one of these places um, where, where they have a panel of architects to, to, uh, from which they will uh, choose um, to do particular works. Uh, what you see on the screen here, though, is, is not actually uh, got to do with, with uh, those things. Actually, it is. This building here was by Metier 3, and that was, uh, that was the product of... of uh, of a competitive tender from, from a panel of architects registered with Melbourne Uni. Um, <clears throat> but there's uh, different ways of doing it. Those panel architects uh, do not necessarily get a go when there's special buildings within the university, flagship buildings that the university wants to build um, and they want uh, something beyond, uh, beyond what their panel can do. And this is certainly the case with the Melbourne School of Design, which is uh, the University of Melbourne uh, Faculty of Architecture building. They had a limited competition um, where they invited um, for expressions of interest, expressions of interest um, from, from architects or conglomerates of architects, um, uh, from which they chose a short list of, of five groups and basically paid them um, uh, each uh, a fee to produce a sketch design, so it was a limited competition, which was won by uh, Nadir Tarani and John Wardle Architects, um, which resulted in the uh, in the um, building that we see here. Now, it does take a, a certain type of institution to to uh, recognize the value of, of of these sorts of competitions and, and these sorts of architects. Um, and that very much had to do with the influence of the architecture faculty uh, on the university above it to, to actually get this done. Because Melbourne Uni certainly has built a lot of really crap buildings um, where we, where for which uh, architectural um, quality, if you like, was, was not high on their priorities. And of course, Melbourne Uni is, is, uh, is, is famous for, for being somewhere which, which uh, um, has a really good line of bullshit but uh, doesn't always practice what it preaches. So while the Faculty of Architecture has one of the best uh, uh, architectural research uh, programs in the country, the best architectural research program in the country, especially of uh, uh, Australian architectural history, um, on the same note you have the University of Melbourne, uh, uh, who is, which is going around uh, pro uh, buying heritage buildings like the Elizabeth Tower Motel of uh, 1957, heritage listed, low listing, but still heritage listed, and demolishing it um, to, to build uh, some new uh, 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 anonymous glass building despite the, uh, the protestations of the Faculty of Architecture. So the, the, the university management does pick and choose as to how it's going to use uh, how it's going to use uh, the, uh, its, its architectural uh, skill set, if you like. Uh, a different, uh, perhaps, uh, way of doing it uh, can be seen at, at RMIT. Uh, so this uh, primarily came from the influence of, of uh, Leon van Skyck, who came to uh, 
RMIT in uh, 1989 to be the new head of departments um, uh, of, of architecture. Um, so uh, essentially the, the same position as, as, uh, as, as Michael Jasper, right? Because uh, it was just the, the head of the program. That was his uh, position. And uh, he immediately uh, moved, uh, began to, to try and sit on the, on the committees in, within the university uh, that decided on, on what was going to be built and who was going to design it, and who was going to build it, and so on and so forth. So he sat on all these procurement committees, essentially, and he was able to, to bring uh, his influence to bear on RMIT and bring them on board to show them the value of, of, uh, of uh, procuring uh, uh, considered architecture uh, in, in, in order to uh, improve the uh, um, reputation or, or the uh, sort of visual reputation of the university, if you like. So the first, uh, Leon's first uh, success was, was uh, the, the Building 8, uh, was Building 8 in 1993, uh, where uh, Peter Corrigan basically put six stories on top of uh, John Andrews building, which you see down the bottom here, uh, which was originally a 12-story building, but only three stories down the bottom was, was actually built. So um, this uh, was also uh, Corrigan's uh, first very large uh, commission. So the architect school, architecture school then played a role in, in promoting uh, a local architects, not to mention the fact that Corrigan was actually a, uh, a long-term uh, part-time lecturer at, at RMIT. So the school, was, so Leon basically saw this confluence between uh, the people who taught there um, also getting a chance to, to produce architecture at, at RMIT. And this continued uh, in uh, 1996 with, uh, with Story Hall uh, by Ashton Raggett McDougall. Ashton Rag oh, oh, um, Howard Raggett and Ian McDougall were both uh, long-term design studio tutors uh, at RMIT. Peter Corrigan uh, who taught design but also taught architectural history. And uh, so what you see here is, is, is um, really this very direct connection between the design tutors and their ideas about design being implemented in the buildings of, of the university. So for the students there, it was very much like a, a kind of total world where, where what they were being taught was uh, in the end uh, being built in front of their eyes. Um, and Leon's great skill was that he, he realized that it was uh, really uh, about uh, the provision of facilities and, and not about uh, and, and that the, uh, the bean counters, if you like, the, the accountants who controlled the funds and the university managers didn't care too much about how the buildings looked just as long as, as their space provisions and their budgets were met. Um, Moving right along, this also extended to, to smaller projects um, like uh, the Building 9 extension on, on the right by Peter Elliott Architects uh, who also uh, redid Bowen Street which was uh, an old kind of uh, back street and he turned it into an urban plaza. So uh, Peter Elliott is, was, uh, was yet another one of the design studio uh, leaders uh, within RMIT and uh, again uh, you see the same thing happening. This uh, then continued more uh, through uh, the Swanson uh, Academic Building by Lions Architects. And Lions Architects, a lot of these um, uh, long-time design studio teachers were, were brought into to, uh, a master's by publication uh, program that Leon ran, and nowadays a PhD by publication or PhD by design. Um, so not only was, was Leon actually um, getting uh, work for the design tutors in, in the faculty. He was also um, uh, organizing ways for uh, the professional, uh, for, for the, the, the design tutors who were also professionals to get higher degrees so that they could keep working as, as design uh, lecturers and design tutors at the school. Um, and then uh, the most late, the, the, the latest example here is, of course, the RMIT Design Hub by Sean Gotsall of, of 2012, where the uh, architecture school, where the RMIT Architecture School is, is, uh, is, is now hosted. This building is is uh, is, is 
it's uh, really all concrete and steel. Um, and uh, uh, the internal walls are, are lined with this kind of galvanized steel grate that, that people usually use for access um, gantries on, on roofs and in factories and what have you. And interesting, uh, I mean, Anne Cleary would hate it because there's no pin-up space whatsoever. Uh, so uh, what they've had to do is to buy like a, a, a ton of rare earth magnets where they actually stick their drawings to the steel grates with magnets, which works really well, except that everyone loves those magnets and steals them. And, uh, and so they, they, I think they're kind of uh, um, running the world out of, uh, out of uh, rare earth magnets. Anyway. Uh, moving right along, so I think um, interesting thing for me coming from, from this sort of background, both the Melbourne Uni example uh, and the uh, RMIT example, um, both where it, it's really, both, both places have, have architecture schools and, um, and both places try to use, uh, um, try to practice what they preach in, in, t in that they try and get um, they try and get uh, uh, good architects to actually uh, execute work uh, in, in the university. So uh, I think uh, uh, in our case at UC, uh, we're, we're not quite up to, to that stage yet, but certainly this is, uh, this is, um, this is something that uh, we should be aiming to. Interestingly, Building 7 was, was designed by Roger Johnson, uh, who was also the first uh, head of department, the, the, also the first course convener of, of architecture at, at, at uh, what was then, um, what was then, what, what did it used to be called? Canberra Institute of Technology? No. Yeah. Canberra Institute of Technology? No, no. It was, yeah, it was something like CRT. Yeah, it was Canberra College of Advanced Education, yeah. CCAE, that was it. So, uh, this is just to show you guys what the potential of, of, uh, of architecture schools are within uh, the, the kind of uh, management frameworks of universities. Um, this is not a criticism of, of the way things happen at UC. UC is quite a different place to, to Melbourne Uni and RMIT and, and a much smaller place. So uh, really there's, there's other sort of, uh, there's other um, spheres of influence at play. So moving right along, the third kind of uh, traditional client for, for architects or traditional client bodies for architects are, are corporate or commercial clients. Um, in this case, uh, these clients are often uh, people who target particular architects because of, of, their, of the architecture that they produce or, or you know, for the, the sort of uh, a confluence of ideas, if you like. So on the right, you see the um, uh, what is now known as uh, 140 William Street, what was uh, uh, designed and built as BHP House by Yunkin Freeman in 1972. So what you see is, is really a, a very interesting exploration of the use of steel in architecture for a company that produces steel. And then on the left you see uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Frank Gehry um, poring over the new campus design for, for Facebook. And uh, of course, then you have the confluence of, of these people who, uh, who uh, like to see themselves as, as progressive and probably are progressive. Um, now, and of course, government has, has uh, always been a, 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 a traditional client for, for architects. And, and, uh, and uh, architects get employed through, through the same kinds of means, either through personal connections or architectural competitions. And so on, and, and so on, and so forth. It was interesting to, to hear what um, Natalie was saying before, because one of the one of the things that uh, that uh, I used to do when uh, when I first um, started practicing was that I did used to pour through all the different uh, lists of tenders uh, that were put out by the by local government and state government in Victoria, in particular. And that's what uh, Natalie was saying. Tenderlink and ACT procurement have tender portals. So that's how a lot of uh, young architects uh, get, their, get their start, is, is by actually uh, pitch, uh, putting in uh, four tenders to, to design small things, you know, like infrastructure, toilet blocks, uh, park benches, and so on and so forth. Uh, not necessarily. 
it depends yeah because the tenders may not quite often if it's a if it's a government thing they may already have their own panel of builders they may they will definitely have their own uh, uh, technical staff as well and they will also have their own contract administrators so they may only be asking for the design of something uh, for which you don't necessarily you may not need to to be a registered architect Okay, can we get to that after? Just, just hold that thought and then uh, we'll come back to that. So, um, finally, there's uh, non traditional uh, uh, clients and employees for architects. The obvious one is, is film and theatre producers. So, here we see. Um, here you see one of the set designs for the Victorian State Opera um, at the State Theatre uh, by Peter Corrigan. Corrigan's other life was designing uh, uh, sets uh, and working with, with, uh, with uh, directors, producers, choreograph choreographers, and so on and so forth. And of course, the, the modern version would, would be uh, uh, in, in, in uh, animation. So uh, there's lots of architects who actually go into um, uh, go into working for film producers um, to, to uh, do the specific sort of CGI type of stuff. So Weta, uh, Peter Jackson's production house, who does uh, Lord of the Rings, who does a lot of the Rings uh, franchise, um, hires a lot of uh, um, animators. Uh, a lot of them uh, have traditionally come from, from architecture schools, and, and they do really obscure things. So, so I know one guy who, who uh, was traveling the world, first working for Sony, then for Weta, and all he did was he did the lighting for, for the animation. He didn't do any of the figures, didn't do anything else. He just worked out the lighting and the shadows uh, for, for all of the CGI stuff. So, you know, these, these are, this is one, one kind of uh, non-traditional clients. Um, the, the, the second one has been around for a long time, would be uh, as product manufacturers. Now up here, I show you a range of uh, uh, products from uh, the Italian company Alessi. So we've got uh, Philippe Stark's work on, on the left, uh, being uh, the, the sort of uh, citrus juicer, the coffee cups by DCM, and the, the coffee cups and spoon by DCM, and then the, the cafeteria percolators by Aldo Rossi. So once an architect gets to a certain uh, of status, if you like, then they start uh, being courted by these people who also want to, to cash in on, on their on their fame, if you like. As you can see, there's, there's, uh, 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 they they are purely cashing in on the brand of the architect. They are indiscriminate almost in in what the architect's work is about. I haven't shown any of Michael Graves' one either. Okay, the question is, is uh, could you go and uh, uh, basically create your own uh, furniture products? I think the, what, what yes, uh, uh, you know, furniture for, for, for your own architectural projects and what have you. Yes, certainly it is possible. I don't think it's a big money spinner. Um, the thing is that if you look at uh, all the famous chairs that have been done uh, that are now produced by Casina and, and Henry Miller. So Henry Miller produces all of um, uh, Eames's, the Eames' uh, chairs, uh, and, and Casina has a license to do all the Mies van der Rohe chairs and the Corbusier chairs and so on and so forth. The great irony with all of this is that the designers had uh, designed them to be cheap production items, and now they're like the most expensive things known to mankind. So uh, the, Eames, uh, uh, bent, uh, the Eames plywood armchair and, and ottoman with the black leather uh, now retails uh, for about $8,000. And <laughs> the mad black one, and, and there's a big mad black in in in, in Canberra. Um, look, uh, the other architects also get on to 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 act as as uh, le uh, to to. Uh, 
Architects also get employed by legal practitioners to act as expert witnesses. So quite often that's uh, to do with something specifically architectural for which uh, they need to they need someone who knows what they're talking about. So I've just put a, a link there to, to a set of Australian architects who, who actually do this kind of work, and I'll leave you to go and have a look at it. Um, and finally, uh, many architects work as, as academics. So all of, this, uh, all of these people that you see up on your screen here um, have at one stage or another worked as, as uh, they all trained as, as uh, architectural practitioners, and they all worked in practice at some stage uh, during their career. Even Gavork. Gavork worked for, uh, worked for a few years in an architectural practice before he uh, went to do his PhD and, and moved into academia. So um, doesn't Michael look young in this picture? <laughs> and, and Ursa looks like some sort of 1930s modernist uh, uh, sort of apparatchik, you know, um, in, in some smoky cafe in, in, in Budapest or something. Um, um, yes, and this was the picture of Erin from the, from the cover of the Canberra Times um, as well. So, uh, that's uh, all I've got. Any questions uh, about about uh, the lecture or comments? I hope this. Uh, I hope you you know you guys uh, have gotten a, a bit of a uh, bit more information. I've given you a, a few more clues as to uh, as to uh, how to uh, progress your 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 um, business plan strength. Uh, yes, certainly, yes, yes. But have you seen how much tutors get paid? Yes, you can list tutoring as... Um, <laughs> graduate architects get to work 37 and a half hours a week. Tutors only get to work for, for only get paid for the time of the tutorial, um, you know, and turn up otherwise uh, because of their good grace and, and their generous nature. So... Um, no, because registration, coming back to your question, Deb, about, about registration, uh, registration strictly is, is about uh, working under a registered architect. Yeah, uh, Working under a registered architect uh, in, in, in producing architecture, in, in, uh, in, in producing core services. Um, let me just uh, move this around. So, so the question is: is uh, can you get uh, um, can you get uh, can you put down on your logbook the, the project management experience you have with the builder? Uh, no. It, it generally has to be. Un I think there is there is a small list of of exceptions, but by and large, what you need to do is is you need to work for under a registered architect, which means you need to work in the office for which uh, the, one of the leaders is a registered architect. Now, now with uh, going back to your original question, um, you can claim, uh, I think you need something like 3,000 hours. I think, I think it's something like 3,000 hours in your logbook. Uh, now, out of those 3,000 hours, I think something like 1,000 of those hours can be claimed um, before you graduate. And, and the rest of it has to be done as a graduate. Um, Mel? Oh, I was, okay. I was going to say the same thing. I think it's now 3,500 hours, and it's how many hours you can claim before. The, the, if you guys, um, are, like, it's very clear what the registration requirements are on the website. They have a quite a clear pamphlet, so it does step through what can count, what can't count. Because then there's seven criteria that you have to fulfil, and there's three different types of activity, um, observational, Okay, let me let me show you. 
So all this is run on too, too many microphones, you know, and anyone would think I'm trying to be a bloody r rapper or something. Now let me go to the, uh, I've actually loaded uh, all these things on the uh, Moodle site. Okay. So let me log on to the Moodle site and then we can... Uh, <coughs> I just change the I just change the parameters of the of the uh, tech one assignment because uh, because I all I, that's all I could think about from two a.m. this morning. Okay, going uh, here. If we go down to. I went onto that. Um, onto that. Where is it? No. Um, every fucking week. Oh, I apologize for swearing. It's, I'm sure I had it here. Group assignments, oh, very good. No, not that one. Yeah, no, it's, it's not in there, so let me just have a look. A, A, C, A. Um, so if we go to the A, A, C, A, and then we go to pathways to registration and go to architectural practice exam, it, it, uh, it talks, it, those are the three parts. And then under uh, more information, I think this is where I saw it. Minimum of 3,300 hours of experience that uh, uh, meets the allocated requirements across 15 performance criteria. Um, so, where is that? Insert photo here. Competency summary. Those. Ah. Is this it? Anyway, perhaps we will uh, Is this it? Okay, I'll have to go and look for it. We'll have to go and look for it. Um,
Pathways, APE Part 1, Practical Experience, Relevant Performance Criteria. Is this the 15 points? There's eight points. Candidates are required to have experience in each of the 15 performance criteria. So there it is. Okay. Yes. Go. Okay, overseas experience, uh, overseas uh, qualifications, yes. Um, if you have uh, qualifications from uh, uh, from Commonwealth cr countries, uh, generally it's, it's directly uh, applicable. Um, otherwise, uh, the first thing they look for is, is for, uh, for you to have done a, a five-year degree. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, essentially they have to, to uh, look at your portfolio of all, the, of all your work um, and uh, all the unit outlines for all the units that you've done and compare them to, to, uh, to uh, um, Australian standards to, to see uh, to see how they compare. So yeah. it could be equivalent with Australian standard or equivalent, in other words, or uh, you can use it as a dose particular point for registration. Uh, yes, you can. So, so if you have a, an if you have an acceptable or an approved uh, overseas qualification, you can use that for for accreditation, but. Uh, if you had uh, an, uh, an approved, uh, 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 in your, are you talking about your own case, Sana? So, so in, in your case, uh, perhaps this is something you should have found out before you started. <laughs> but, but I mean, for, in your case, uh, uh, the reason, I guess the reason you're studying the masters is because uh, they didn't accept your, your qualifications? Yeah, uh, from from my experience, it's, it's quite difficult if if you're you're not in uh, not in a Commonwealth, even if you're in an American system, it's it's quite difficult to 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 get uh, equivalent qualifications. Sarah. But if you have a master's of architecture, which yeah, is a, yeah, if you have your, if once you've finished with your master's of architecture. But I think if you have a, if you have a. Which one? The. Yeah. That's applying for certain certain classes of visa, yeah. That's only if you're applying for a visa. Yeah. So so what it means is that um, um, yeah. I don't think you go through that though. Well, do you go through that? I suppose you must. Yeah, because you have uh, because if you're going for a visa and and you uh, have an Australian qualification, that's where you go. That must be where you go through. So that becomes more a visa issue rather than an accreditation issue. Yeah. So I think what they're saying there is that the uh, the A A C A will verify your qualifications uh, for the visa authorities. Yes. Uh, any other questions?
not uh, uh, mostly yes. So, so if um, if you're registered in uh, in Australia, then it's very easy for you to register in uh, New Zealand, for example, and in the UK, and and vice versa. And and I believe also in South Africa uh, and Canada. Uh, in fact, it's easier for me to register in New Zealand than it is to, for me to register in South Australia, uh, uh, both of which I've looked into. I've actually registered in South Australia, and um, really I needed to get a working with children check, I needed to get a police check, I needed this check, that check, and needed to pay bucket loads of money, even though I wasn't necessarily practicing. So. So uh, it was. Uh, it was. It took. It took a couple of weeks to get all that stuff together, um, because then you need to do. You know, you need to get all this stuff signed off by justices of the peace and so on and so forth. So with with New Zealand, you just send them a link to to where you're already accredited, and uh, and uh, send them a and then and they will just give you accreditation. Same with the ACT. Which are you know sensible places, not like South Australia. Yes, but it, it also applies to to uh, uh, the the uh, AACA also has a, a series of of um, uh, accredited or associate uh, um, architecture schools overseas, and if you come from an architecture school on that list, or that is accredited with a associated accredited program then you can just transfer your um, uh, qualifications over. So as far as that 3,000 hours or My understanding of that is that you can do it uh, if just as long as you do it for uh, an architect uh, registered in an Australian jurisdiction, regardless of where they are practicing, uh, they can that counts as working under Australian architect. So I was doing, I was signing logbooks for Australian graduates when I was working in Malaysia, who were working for me. So. Okay, very good. Now, uh, shall we uh, split into our uh, tutorial groups? Thanks, everyone. So, so um, we'll uh, stick to the same tutorial groups as last week. For, for, we'll just stick to the same tutorial groups for, for this entire uh, group assignment. Yes, uh, uh, there is a, um, a, a water fountain on the way to the room. I'll, I'll, get, you, I'll get you a cup. Would you like a cup?
question was specific about the
first one I'm not going to make money because we can't charge. Ultimately, it'll be cheaper anyway. It's going to be much quicker than working with clients because it's going to be working on standard design. So the client is buying a design. There's not much difference with any creator. So that means we can charge much less fee. It's going to cost the same fee. It's going to cost full fee to do the first one. Uh, but you, if you just charge sort of half fee, and then you do two, you break even. If you do three, you're making money. Or each design, you're making money. 